Hello and welcome to our webinar. Today, we'll discuss programs that support black women business owners. I'm Jean Rourke from the Federal Reserve and I'll be your facilitator. The host of our call today is Del Gines from the Kansas City Fed. And Del will introduce our speakers in just a moment. And before turning our call over to Del, I'll run through our call logistics. If you haven't joined us through the webinar yet, go ahead and click the, click the link you received after registering. For the best webinar experience, use the FAQ document, which can be found using the Materials button in the Webinar Player page. I'll highlight a few important notes for you. You can listen to the audio through your PC speakers or through the phone. If you choose the phone option, slides will not sync with audio unless you change your settings. You can do this by selecting the gray gear located on the upper right corner of the slide window, just above the presentation. From there, you should see a few options in the media chooser. Please select the phone option, but that's only if you're listening through the phone. You can expand the size of the slides today, and to do that, just use the Maximize button in the upper right corner of the slide window, located on the webinar player page. And if you'd like a PDF version of today's presentation, you can access it using the Materials button. Okay, we'd love to hear from you today, and we'll take your questions at any time during our call. And to submit your question, you can use the Ask Question button on the webinar player page. We'll get your questions queued up for our presenters today. And with all of that out of the way, it is my pleasure to turn our call over to Del Gines from the Kansas City Fed. All right, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you know that's on. I'm really excited to to do this presentation. It's a continuation of a lot of work that we've been putting in over the past year um, to support Black women entrepreneurs. We've got some phenomenal um, presenters for you today. I've met them all. Uh, individually, and I know some more than others, and so I'm really excited to have them share some of the, the really great programs that they have that are supporting, you know, women of color, black women in particular. Um, today we're going to have three speakers, um, Essence Lawson, who's the Atlanta Community Lead at Digital Undivided, Makisha Booth, who's the CEO and founder of Sisterpreneurs, and then Terry Sanders, who's the site manager of the Fair Deal Marketplace, um, that are all going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about their programs um, and how those programs are designed and how they support uh, black women business owners. So this is going to be awesome. Um, and just a, a few things. Uh, if you can't stay for the whole webinar, we will be putting it on the website in a few weeks, and so you'll be able to see anything that you may have missed. So if you have to run or anything, whatever, you can um, always visit back later. Also, if you want to read the report um, that we have released, you can go to the website as well at kansascityfed.org. Um, and you can find it on the community development section, as well as all the other things that um, that we're going to be putting on that page uh, to support black women um, business owners. So without uh, further ado, let's move to uh, the next slide. And so just a quick overview. Uh, so you, most of you may not be familiar with the Federal Reserve Bank system, but we're 12 um, independent banks that work under the board in conjunction with the Board of Governors, uh, really to be the monetary policy organization of the nation. Our bank, the Kansas City Fed, serves um, in a lot of the cities with uh, states in the Midwest. Um, all are part of those cities. And we really work to, at least in the community development department side, support the needs of underserved communities and communities with distressed economies. Next slide. And so I do, in every presentation that I've done so far, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it, um, in a second, I have to give a special shout-out to the wonderful uh, owners of Smash Glam, uh, Tiffany Cody and Aisha, Bull Aisha Bullocks, uh, for just the, the wonderful photos that they provided for us, um, that you, some that you saw on the first slide, and then also this picture, as well as the others in the report, um, of all the awesome real-life uh, women entrepreneurs. When I put the, the, uh, the report together, I went to our designer and I said, I want something that captures um, – the energy of black women business owners. And so we reached out to Tiffany and Aisha, and they said, yes, we'd love to share some of the photo photographs of these awesome entrepreneurs that they've taken. So they do corporate headshots and things like that. And so all the great pictures that you see in the report and on our website and everything else is directly a result of these awesome business owners. Next slide. And so to pro provide a context for why we're do having this conversation, is what most people don't realize is that black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the nation. Um, and when you can control the population, it's not even really close. 
And so when I go out and I ask the question for a show of hands, I ask how many of you knew that black women businesses grew by over a million from 2002 to 2012 and that all of one, one out of every three women on businesses during that time period was started by a black woman and one out of every five uh, of all businesses were started by a black woman, usually out of a crowd of 50. And I just um, did this presentation in St. Louis last week. We had 70 people and out of the 70 people there, only two people raised their hand that knew that this phenomenon was occurring. It's an unprecedented phenomenon in the history of America, and nobody's really talking about it with, with, with any a real meaning. And so we started last year. And you can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So when we started last year, being that my responsibility for the Bank of Small Business and Economic Development, and I do a lot of work uh, around black and brown and, and diverse issues, went to my boss and said, we really need to do something about this, this, this lack of attention um, is not beneficial, uh, and we need to utilize the power of the Fed and our megaphone voice and our brand to really showcase the phenomenal work that uh, black women are doing in the business arena and then also try to figure out how we can help them scale. And so we really asked um, – we did a series of focus groups last year that serve as the foundation of the report. We coupled it with some other data, and I asked all these awesome women four uh, questions, which is why did you start, what were your challenges, what support did you receive, and what do you wish was available? And then we summarized that in the report. And so just a little context of the energy that we put around this, um, we've, we did an outreach in going on 10 cities now. Uh, the last one will be out in Los Angeles that I'll be doing in December. Of course, we do this webinar. We've done media releases, um, and we've done a lot of other outreach. We have a video series coming out of interviews that will be on our website soon of, of, of four uh, women business owners talking about these issues their challenges and their needs. And then, of course, we want to move it more from the awareness issue to activation. And my objective is how do we get more communities across the nation to take black women businesses seriously and to put serious policy and program support behind it so we can really help support these women to scale because it's going to benefit not only our cities, but it will benefit our national economy as a whole. And so that serves as the backdrop of this presentation because when I was going around to all these cities talking to all these women, these economic developers, policymakers, they're like, share with us some of the, some programs that are out there that we can look at and either bring to our community or model. And so I looked at three different programs because I couldn't find many, and I just happened to find three really good ones through relationships and exposure. And so that's what we're going to um, share with you today. The first up is Essence from um, Lofton from Digital Undivided, and I will turn it over to you, Essence, to talk about your wonderful program. Thank you, Dell, and thank you to the Federal Reserve. We appreciate the opportunity to introduce Digital Undivided and the Real Unicorns of Tech uh, to your community. As Dell mentioned, everyone, my name is Essence Lofton, and I am serving as the Atlanta Community Lead for Digital Undivided. Uh, we actually just made an announcement yesterday that we are expanding and scaling to the Newark, New Jersey area. So I also will be assisting with the community piece for um, that geographical location um, in the near future. Next slide, please. Okay. So who are we? Digital Undivided is a social enterprise that was founded by Catherine Finney, our Managing Director, and Darlene Gillard, who is our Director of Special Projects and Community back in 2013. We work to serve early stage founders that are women of color, women of color, black and Latinx women, to develop their own economic security through innovative approaches with businesses that are focused on high-tech growth and development. Next slide, please. There are three ways that Digital Undivided works to serve this community of women. The first and one of the most important for us right now is our research. We have a biennial research project called Project Diane that we released um, that talks about the state of women founders across the country, women of color founders, rather, across the country, and how little 
they raise in capital for venture funding and how many of them are represented in each state across the country. Back in June of this year, we released Project Diane um, African American version, and we solely focused on African American founders across the country. And we were not surprised but disheartened at the fact that there is only about point zero 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 six percent of capital raised by women of color for their businesses, although we are the fastest growing market of business owners, as Dell mentioned earlier. Last month, we actually released our Project Diane Latinx version and were surprised to see that the number of the amount, rather, of capital raised for Latinx women was even lower at 0.0002%. So although women of color do serve as a great pipeline for businesses in their communities, we are still behind the eight ball by a lot in terms of what we're able to raise in venture funding for our businesses. So that leads us to do a lot of bootstrapping where we are, you know, funding our businesses ourselves and not really seeking the investment because the opportunity is not available for us. Another big part of Digital Undivided is our incubator program. We call it the Big Incubator, and it is our nine-month program that we put all of our women founders through in order to help them develop their businesses. We take a lean startup approach to developing the curriculum, and the program itself is broken down into four different modules. If you're familiar with incubators or accelerators, typically you will find that a common way to produce them is to have the founders come in with their business ideas, and they immediately begin to work on the company development. We take another approach, and I'll explain uh, a little bit more why in a little bit, but we take a different approach, and we kind of go backwards. So what we do, because they're early-stage founders, is we focus on the actual business idea. So we allow the founders to spend 10 weeks doing nothing but customer discovery. And if you're not familiar with it, another way to look at customer discovery is market research. So because they're early stage, we have an idea that about 95% of the founders' ideas will change because once you actually challenge them to focus on interviewing between one to 200 people who they do not know, they learn that all of their business ideas that are expressed may or may not be viable, sustainable, and scalable. And again, since we're focused on helping our founders develop high growth business ideas that are going to actually prepare them for exits, that's a key factor in continuing throughout the program. So company, I'm sorry, um, customer development is first, which is customer discovery. So they do that for 10 weeks. The second module after that is going to be product development. We challenge them, and actually it's a KPI for us, is to have them come out of that module with a live MVP, uh, minimal viable product, and that can be their websites, their apps if it's applicable to, you know, what they're creating, and also if they have any products, if that's applicable to what they're creating. Very last, we focus on the actual company development. And the idea there is that we want to make sure that as they're going throughout the program and putting forth all their efforts and research and in labor, that they actually are developing a real company at the end of the nine months. So company development is the last thing that they do in order to ensure that the company structure is developed properly. We have a very, very large mentor network that helps us throughout the program or helps each founder throughout the program. Some are with us from Module 1 all the way to Demo Day, which is coming up for us uh, next month in December. But we have something that's really cool in our program called Mentor Madness, where the founders actually have the opportunity to work one-on-one with mentors throughout the program and help them to develop the idea from another perspective. So the big team, which includes myself, program director, a managing director, and team, also provide them with feedback, but it's always helpful to get 
information and feedback from founders in the community who are ahead of where our current founders are and also some of the mentors who have expertise in specific areas like, you know, software engineering, development, digital marketing, to also provide them with insight about the programs. Because our founders are women of color, we do realize that they do face other challenges besides just being able to raise capital. Um, we have developed a portion of our program called Confident Founders, and we think that it's important to address both sides of the coin. So, yes, we're going to address the development of their businesses and all of the hardships that come along with that, but also just being a woman of color can create its own challenges with not having support and resources. So with Confident Founders, we encourage our founders to have open dialogue about their struggles and to know that they're not going through it by themselves. We bring in help. We have, you know, meditation, we have yoga, we talk about resources and we share resources for some things as simple as child care that, you know, our counterparts may not be able to understand. We also bring in, you know, the, the founders' families to have them understand firsthand what their family members are going through as business owners so that they can be on board and assist with any child care, cooking dinner, just the little things that we don't think about that can be super stressful to our founders that would stop them from moving forward with developing their businesses. Our applications actually open on our demo day this year, which is December the 6th. This is our third cohort that we're wrapping up right now. So we'll be beginning our fourth in February of 2019. The last way that Digital Undivided works is with community which is what my role is. So as the Atlanta community lead, my role is multifaceted. One way that I uh, impact the community here is by hosting events that we have in our space. Um, we have a lifestyle space here downtown Atlanta, and I host Lunch and Learns for our founders in our communities where I bring in local founders who are able to tell their stories and have more of an intimate conversation about scaling, growing, and developing a business. We also have Innovation Thursdays, which is usually um, more of an established entrepreneur who comes in and talks to our founders in the community about similar things, about personal success, um, professional success, careers, various things, and also being out in the community for events, looking for mentors for our founders, looking for partnership opportunities for us to be able to move forward and provide different pathways for our founders. So some may choose to go to an accelerator and develop their business ideas further once they leave us and or it might be them seeking investment. Next slide, please. This slide represents a portion of Project Diane. Back in April, we actually highlighted from our research 27 black women who have raised more than $1 million in venture funding. 27 is not a big number. And given what I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that we only received 0.0006% of venture funding, this was a big feat for us to find this, these 27 women who raised over $1 million, which is why we call them the real-life unicorns. We now have discovered that there are 34 black women who have raised more than $1 million in venture funding since Project Diane was released back in June of this year. As I also mentioned previously, we've seen based upon our research that there has been a 500% increase in funding for black women founders and a 250% increase in the number of startups led by black women, but we have a long way to go. We are in um, collaboration with a few different organizations to try to help solve that problem, one of which is one of our supporters, the Kauffman Foundation, uh, based out in Kansas City, and they um, work with us to try to help solve the problem of the community that we're serving. And we have other programs that we are actually launching to help all levels, meaning our incubator serves a large demographic of women here um, all over the country, actually. We have founders come through. But we're also developing a program called GROW that is going to be in place for founders who may not be at the 
ideation, uh, I'm sorry, the middle stage ideation level of their business idea. They may need just resources in how to develop business plans, how to do a business model canvas. We don't want to leave any women behind. Our goal is to impact the community one founder at a time, and we're looking to find pathways for all women at all different levels of ideation in the process. Next slide, please. So I'd love to welcome any questions that you all have. Um, a great way to connect with us and learn more about Project Diane is by visiting our website at www.digitalundivided.com. My email address, if you have any questions after today or after this presentation, is listed here at essence at digitalundivided.com, and we encourage you to follow us on social media on all platforms at digital, I'm sorry, at D-I-G-U-N-D-I-V. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Essence. And we'll have all the contact information again on the final slide for everyone in case you miss it as we're going through. Um, one question, Essence, is what are the challenges of working with women of color who aren't familiar with tech and getting them to become uh, solid tech entrepreneurs? That's a great question. And all of our founders, except for probably about one, are non-technical. So we are not expecting or nor is our criteria mandatory for any of our founders to, have to be developers or learn coding or anything like that. They're all non-technical. What we do is with the Lean Startup approach, it's more like a curriculum that we follow. For example, in the second module, since their KPI is to have a live uh, MVP developed before they leave the 10 weeks, we consider that one of our technical modules. So we bring in in software engineers, developers, designers, to help them build their platforms. We have workshops four different weekends in that module that are um, the subjects are Agile, WordPress, Scrim and Scrum, Zaps and Hooks. So we're teaching them as they go along how to use specific technology, but we don't require them to be technical founders. Awesome. And we have a couple more questions, but they're really general questions, so I'm going to ask to all three of you in the end. So with that, again, we appreciate, you know, the, the program. It's an awesome program. Uh, I encourage you all to look, go to the website, look at it, look at what they do and learn a little bit more uh, about it. And hopefully we'll hear from Essence on one of the questions that we have again in, in, in a minute. Um, I want to pivot over to um, Sisterpreneurs and Makisha Booth, the CEO. I got a chance to meet her and hang out with her. At a little coffee shop, I think it was black owned, a uh, black owned coffee shop, was in the key shop out in Denver, um, and we just got to sit, sit and really talk about um, black women in business and her program, her pivots, and the awesome program that they have. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Makisha and share about the program that they're doing um, out in Denver. So Makisha, the floor is yours. Thanks, Del. Hello, I am Makisha Booth with the Foundation for Black Entrepreneurship, and I'm the founder of Sisterpreneurs. Um, I'm a business and rapid improvement coach, and I want to share a little bit about our program and our brand, Sisterpreneurs, with you today. Um, and, Dell, thank you. I want to thank the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and Dell for the amazing work you're doing um, to bring light and attention and resources to um, black women entrepreneurs in the work we're all doing. Um, so I'll move to the next slide to kind of tell you a little bit about our programming. So what lights our fire? Um, the Foundation for Black Entrepreneurship and all of our programs are designed to help um, black micro businesses play big and overcome the fear and other very real-life barriers um, in the way of their ability to scale. Um, Sisterpreneurs is our main sub-brand, and it's a line of products and services that target um, the black female entrepreneur for all of the reasons articulated both in Dell's report and even Essence's um, presentation earlier. Um, we're working daily to help close the wealth, credit, and trust gap for um, our entrepreneurs so that they can access capital, um, the resources that they need, the capacity that they need to succeed and scale. Um, and Sisterpreneurs is also um, was designed to create a safe space um, for black women entrepreneurs. Um, Dell's report noted that um, there was often a report of workplace um, dissatisfaction or even trauma 
um, that led a lot of the women, black black women entrepreneurs in the focus group to, to even start their business. And so Sisterpreneurs is all about creating that sisterhood and a community for black women entrepreneurs um, to build their entrepreneurial skills and grow their businesses. So we offer training, coaching, um, technical services. We are a business clinic. And um, all of our programs are in year one um, in exiting pilot mode and moving into year two now. Um, next slide, please. So before I kind of share a little bit about our programs, I want to note that um, behind all of our work um, is a concept that we call the big deal. Um, and, uh, again, the report made it clear that while we're the fastest-growing group of entrepreneurs, we're at the lower end of the success totem pole in terms of revenues and revenue generation, and we struggle to scale and play big and access capital. So the big deal, well, how we describe the big deal is it's a, a bootstrapper's first access to capital and technical support um, that helps them shift from bootstra bootstrapping mode to and, and put them on the path to expansion and scale. And often that means that they're moving from the business to customer model to a business to business model. Um, and so we have four kind of main quote unquote big deals that we target um, to help our businesses uh, uh, land. The first is I've got products, but I'm at like a, I'm, I'm selling them at local fairs or um, I have sales trickling in online where we're going to help you um, land a wholesale account and place your products in retail stores. The second big deal is government contracts. And so I might be a one-off service provider um, in terms of clients, but now I'm going to land an account with various government agencies um, and become certified to do so. Um, and then maybe I want to expand my business, but I don't have the capital to move into a larger space or, or purchase more inventory, so we're going to help you land um, your first business loan, traditional loan. And then finally, there's a, everywhere you turn, there's business competitions and pitches. And so the fourth big deal is the business challenge or pitch, um, and we help prepare folks to pitch um, and we use design thinking and lean startup and those sorts of things to help them do MVP work and um, customer validation, product validation with their customers. So those are the four big deals, and we're usually looking for women business owners who we believe can, we can help position to land one of those big deals. The next slide, please. So speaking more about sort of the programs that folks enroll in, we have two core programs. One is a loan readiness program, um, and that's a nine-month intensive cohort program. Um, there are usually up to 12 folks in the program, and it has sort of four main um, phases or areas of work that we do with the entrepreneur. The first is um, credit repair and restoration. Um, and so we literally have them work with a credit repair um, consultant and company to do active work to clean up their credit um, or build business credit. Um, the second is business coaching, so one-to-one -one business coaching in which they actually do the business model canvassing, um, really rewrite their business plan, rethink their model um, and their product. Um, essence is spot on in that we often have folks come into the program who don't yet, um, haven't done the work of validating their product or their business idea, so we do that work. The third phase is um, for them to um, choose a, um, a loan product that works for them and, and, and apply for the loan. And then the fourth part, and we help them do that, and then the fourth phase is once they actually get the loan or access to capital, they have three months of access to accounting um, services so that they can manage cash flow and, 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 and manage money well. And so that's the loan readiness program. The second program is our sister leads program, and that is a leads group meet sales mastermind program. So um, it's 90 days, um, seven women in each power circle, and they basically generate referrals for each other while, while building out their sales funnels or customer relationship management systems. And so those are our core programs, but we also have various events, brunches. We have a strategic planning, an annual strategic planning two-day retreat that we do annually um, called Gold Digger. And that's to help folks really map out their strategic plans for the upcoming year, their goals and metrics, their action plans for their business, their improvement plans, looking at, you know, operations, finances, and uh, financial planning and, um, and marketing. Next slide, please. So 
So um, just to give you a sense of some of the things that folks have come out of the program, um, you know, saying that, you know, just in this year one, um, it's our technical year two, but really the programming launched in year one. We did a lot of validation in year zero. Um, but they, you know, we've got folks that have landed wholesale deals, that have won um, Denver's Trout Tank, which is our version of Shark Tank. Um, um, but what most of our folks report out in addition to some um, actual transformational um, results are that they learned a lot and, and grew as an entrepreneur. Um, that they built, that they feel like they're part of a, a tight knit community that has their back. Um, that they're focused more on revenue generation, revenue generating activities than they have been before, um, and that they they all say it's a lot of work. We we definitely um, screen on the front end of our programs to make sure that folks coming in are really hungry for change and transformation in their business, ready to do a lot of work um, and engage with the coaches and 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 the instructors in the program. So um, that is, uh, is a quick overview of the entrepreneurs. All right. Hey, we appreciate that. Uh, uh, one one question for you is: Are, are there opportunities for others to mentor within your program? Um, I've got a, a couple questions from folks that say that they have prior business skills and are looking for ways that they can do mentoring. Um, and whether I don't know if they're local to Denver or or your marketplace, but within your model, is, is there opportunity for folks that may want to do some of the mentoring and support of your program? Do you have a a process by which they can do that? For 2019, we will. In 2018, we were building out the program, and so we tried to keep it pretty small in terms of bringing stakeholders to the table, but absolutely please reach out um, in 2019. And it was more unofficial mentoring that we did. So in the instance mm -hmm. of, like, the one who won the Denver Trout Tank, no, we, don't, we didn't have a formal program, but we went down to our Denver Chamber and SBDC and set up um, mentorship with folks down there to help her get ready for that program. And to this day, they have still embraced her and are mentoring her down there. Um, and so we tried to do that informally with everyone, but this coming year we will be looking for more mentors and have a more structured model. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, again, everybody, these are some phenomenal programs, and I, I encourage you, I mean, if you just listen to um, both of them talk, it's not just the programs that are phenomenal, but it's the people that are running them, the energy, the intellect, the commitment. Um, and these are, these are programs that we should support in our local communities, both those that are building them and operating them, but also the programs themselves. So, again, appreciate you, Makisha, and I want to go to our last but definitely not least speaker, which is Terry Sanders, who's from my hometown, of Omaha, Nebraska, known her for years, and she has a phenomenal project that she's working on as the site manager for the Fair Deal Marketplace. So, Ms. Terry, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Dell, and thank you to the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, the Fair Deal Village Marketplace, which is what you see there on the right, that is a project that opened in December of 2016. We are ending our second year this year and going into our third year. Uh, next slide, please. As Dale said, we're located in Omaha, Nebraska. We are located in North Omaha, which is the um, African-American section of the city. And so on this slide, it shows the interior of the Fair Deal Village Marketplace. The thing that is unique about the Fair Deal Village Marketplace is that it is made up of shipping containers. So these are shipping containers that we had finished in such a way that they could accommodate um, small businesses. And the small businesses that occupy the containers are about 90% women-owned. And those businesses, when we were looking for business businesses to occupy, they were either businesses that were online or home-based. And so this is their first um, attempt at having a commercial property. These are below market rate rents for this. It is $250 and $40 for utilities, which is included. So we are very proud of this project. It was funded through the um, a government grant partially, and it is unique. It is the first shipping container um, 
project in um, in the state of Nebraska. So we've had people come from throughout the state to take a look at it. Uh, they each have their own P-TEC unit, which is a heating and air conditioning unit, and they are all connected. There are two containers. One is a double-double, which means it is double-wide and stacked with two more containers. That container um, does not have a floor or ceiling. Our city forefathers could not figure out how to rate that, and so we just let it go at it has a higher ceiling. And then the other double-double actually houses a nail salon. So um, the businesses that are located there are Hand of Gold, which is the nail salon, Fashion Freak, which is a contemporary women's clothing store, Haberdash One, which is a men's store. Uh, we have a massage um, studio going in in December. Around the corner from that is Webmasters, who repairs screens of tablets and phones. Next to that is Divine Inspirations, which is an inspirational gift store and jewelry shop. Next to that is Steel Pop and Gourmet Popcorn. Um, if anybody on the line likes Garrett's popcorn, I invite you to try this because it's better than Garrett's. Next to that is D. Marie's Hair Boutique, which sells hair bundles and accessories. Uh, in the middle of the Fairdale Village Marketplace was built a um, restaurant. If you go to the next slide. That restaurant was originally the Fairdale Cafe, which existed in the um, – 40s and 50s in Omaha, and the cafe was a, was in a strip at the time. And when OEDC acquired that building, um, it was found that because it was in the middle of the strip, it had no walls that would sustain any kind of weight. They were interior walls and not exterior walls. So we tore that down, thus the name the Fairdale Village Marketplace. Uh, in homage to that cafe that was there. And so in rebuilding, we built a cafe in the middle. Um, it has new owners now, and it's called Emery's Cafe, and that is also a young black female entrepreneur who's about 27 years old. And it houses a soul food cuisine and um, bar in the cafe. You see the interior of the cafe up on the upper left, um, we also maintain historic buildings, so the blue tin ceiling in the cafe is from the original building, as is the bar top is made from beams of the original cafe, and the back backing on the bar are bricks from that. So we're pretty proud of that, that we were able to um, keep some of the elements of the original business. To the right, at the upper right-hand corner, you see um, pictures of the actual containers that house the businesses. They are 8 by 20, 8 by 20, 8 by 120. So they're not real big, but they pack a lot of punch. And it was amazing to me how each uh, proprietor chose to refinish their container inside. They are all distinctly different. Uh, in the Lower left corner is one of the proprietors, Yai Johnson, who owns Fashion Freak Boutique, and hers is the Double Double. And then again, you see the courtyard area of the cafe space. Next slide. So the Fair Deal Village Marketplace also has a grocery store. Oops. Also has a grocery store, and it is owned by OEDC, and it is... 2,700 square feet. It is a fresh foods grocery store. It does not sell liquor or tobacco. And we um, attempt to have most of our produce come from Nebraska growers when seasons permit, because, of course, you know we have winter. And so um, the grocery store also has a female manager. While it is owned by OEDC, part of our charge was to employ at least 40 persons uh, from the low-income area in those spaces. We have not quite met that, but we are 
continually striving to meet that goal. That is one of the goals of the grant that we received. So anybody have any questions about the Fairdale Village Marketplace? I think that this is a sisterpreneur slide, and it, oh, it shows everybody. Yeah, no, that's the final slide. I'm not, I'm not okay. sure. That, that may be on me, Terry. I may have missed that, that final slide in any update. Okay, so, uh, no problem. You, you, you can get on me when I come back to Omaha. <laughs> okay, that, that'll work. So there, but there's a, the, uh, one question is, how are you seeing um, the transition from kind of the, uh, you know, at home into the storefront going for some of these women who are kind of making the leap for the first time? Well, I can say that it has been a challenge. It has been two years. Uh, one of the proprietors also owns two other businesses, so she is familiar with having employees and uh, utilizing work schedules and paying payroll. Um, one of the other proprietors actually also has a full-time job, so she has tried to employ family uh, employ friends. She worked with our summer youth employment program and had great success with that. But it is continues to be a challenge of keeping mall hours, which is what we envision the marketplace to be. So that is still a challenge, um, even yet today, two years later, for people to actually realize that when you are in business, you are in business and you maintain business hours uh, consistently, and that is a challenge. And we continually work with them, um, try to find resources. We have partnered with the um, state job program to get employees in there, and so that that is one of the things that is a challenge. Okay. And now I'm going to pivot. The last slide that you see up is all of their contacts. So if you have any additional questions um, about their programs, about potentially uh, bringing their programs, if they are transportable to your community, what that would take. Um, I know, like Essence said, they just uh, moved into Newark as well as in Atlanta. Um, that's their contacts up there. So shoot them an email, visit their websites, um, ask them questions about how they did it. Because obviously we can only cover so much, you know, in the hour that we have. But we have about a good 15 minutes, which is perfect, um, because I want to have a kind of a dialogue with all of you um, around – just some general questions based upon your experience, because the objective of this webinar ultimately is to get more people to see um, the potential of programs for black women, but also some of the innovation around those programs and what they take. And so kind of my first question for all of you, and you can answer, uh, you can answer, you can not answer, you can answer, you know, so whoever wants to hop in, please do. And I know me and you, Makisha, talked about this when I was in Denver what were some of the challenges that you had in actually pitching a program specific to black or black and brown women exclusively in your area, if you had any? Yeah, so, Dell, yeah, we did talk about this. Um, that was a big deal for me. Um, we started the work um, of reaching out to funders to see if we could secure funding to support this work from a nonprofit standpoint um, at the beginning of the year. And we heard a lot from folks that they weren't, um, first of all, a lot of folks weren't aware that black women entrepreneurs were the fastest growing group um, in the country. The report that we put out really brought light and shed light on that and some of the challenges that, at least in my neck of the woods, um, folks didn't have an awareness of. And so it was a bit foreign to go to them and pitch a program specifically for black women entrepreneurs, and they wanted to know why it was necessary. Um, I think that they weren't sure if the funding was uh, necessary or if it was if there was validation for the demand or the need, and also just um, not necessarily understanding the unique challenges um, that the black women entrepreneur faces. And, and, and the report really highlighted a lot of those challenges, but I had to constantly kind of raise those points in, in, in meeting to meeting with various funders to really shed light on that. And so I think just 
is this even a thing is what I heard a lot. And then why will you bring in other folks and, and why are you targeting black women entrepreneurs versus being more inclusive in terms of the work you're doing? And so really explaining the very targeted, culturally responsive approach to our programming um, was a challenge. But eventually folks um, started to come around. Um, but, yeah, the, on the front end, it, it, took some, it took some work. I'd also like to add if I could. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to throw it over to you. Yes, I was going to just jump on and piggyback right off of that, Makisha, because we a challenge that we have in having people visualize what it is our program is about without them being in our space is that the first thought sometimes is that the women who we are serving in our program are underprivileged or uneducated or poor, just to be honest. And we have to always follow up and say, no, this is not the demographic that we're dealing with. The women in our program have master's degrees, PhDs from Georgia Tech. We, in our last cohort, we have an MBA Harvard graduate. So I think the initial misconception of what it means to serve black and brown women is a challenge to initially overcome and just changing the mindset of people who may not be exposed to this type of diversity that, you know, we also are college educated. We have, you know, great business ideas. We're not um, dumb and we don't need like uh, this isn't like a program to like piggyback off of some sort of government assistance. It's not a passion project. It's just addressing a need. So it's like we're a startup trying to help startups. We want to solve a problem, and the problem is that there is a severe lack of funding from women of color, and there's a lack of programs that address the specific needs of women of color. Very much so. That's very well stated. And um, just to, to reiterate kind of one of the things you said, a lot of the experience when I went, I went, when I went around and did all the, the outreach and having conversations with women is you're seeing women that were actually very successful, um, that because of frustrations on the work side or because they had an opportunity, said, I'm going to make the leap. Um, you know, the most notable one was a nuclear engineer making over 160000 a year. She said, I had enough. I'm going to do my own stuff. And then when you look at the data, the black women who are actually starting businesses have a higher education rate than, you know, the average. And then also, as we know, and even though I didn't talk a lot about it, you know, in a lot of presentations, black women are becoming the fastest group of educated, uh, fastest educated group in the nation. So your point is very valid that there's still a lot of stereotypes and stigma, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of lack of awareness that are in the marketplace that I think we, can, we need to work to correct and ensure that organizations like you all are getting the attention and the kind of funding that they deserve. I want, to, I want to pivot to a different type of question. And, Terry, I, I know you've done a lot of business coaching as well as what you're doing at Fairdale, so feel, feel free to weigh in on this one as well. Okay. Um, what, what, do, what are you all seeing as some of the unique and critical needs in your respective programs that may be specific to um, black women who are working, on, uh, working in the business or working on the business? Um, one of the things I see is getting clarity around what they're doing. Um, in the retail space, you know, you have an idea of a business to start, and you start that business, and you wrote a great business plan, and then as you work in the arena, you see what some other people are doing, and you gravitate away from your original plan. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes that is detrimental. And so for the um, person to get clarity around what it is they're really doing and to also identify who their customer is, um, we always think, well, it's a lady who shops. No, it's a little bit more specific than that. What does she do? What kind of car does she drive? Where does she vacation? Does she have children? What is her marital status? What is her level of income? You are not appealing to everybody, but there is a specific, and the term that's being used now is avatar, that people should um, be targeting with their products and with their offers. And so that's what I have found as um, one of the challenges. 
and I know um, both the unique thing about it, and the reason why I had all of you three on, because you all are approaching, you know, you supporting black women differently. One is, you know, physical space. One is working on, you know, high tech. Others is working on, even you know, Keisha, you know, you're working on a little different market of getting people in and scaled up. Um, are you seeing the unique cultural um, opportunities or areas of specific service that uh, working with programs for the, this particular demographic group may be unique to, let's say, a, a majority group, you know, maybe white females versus African-American females in your, your place? Are they bringing in any kind of different cultural opportunities or challenges in service that may need to be addressed? This is Essence. For our founders, well, in our program, rather, I should say, for probably the past two cohorts, we don't have a specific criteria of businesses that we allow um, in our program. Some programs that I've seen in Atlanta and otherwise, they may have like a cap. So you can only have two, you know, businesses that focus on um, agriculture. You may have only, you know, one business that can focus on um, beauty and uh, health or something like that. We actually don't have a cap on any type of business idea. Um, so for us in our past two cohorts, we've had everything from genderless makeup line to a substitute teaching platform. So all of our founders are really addressing needs that they have faced personally. For example, our founder, her name is Jasmine Edwards, who has a platform called iSubs. She's solving a problem of substitute teaching in the Florida area where because she was a substitute teacher and she did it because she needed the money at the time, she realized that there are two problems. One, substitute teachers do not get paid right away, and the schools who employ them temporarily have a hard time finding quality substitute teachers. So you have two different problems that she's solving within her platform, but it was all personal. And I think that that's the theme, if there is one, for our founders that we that we have served is that they've all had personal situations and that they've decided, mm-hmm. here's what I'm looking to solve and here's how I'm going to solve it, and I'm an expert in it because I've already been through it. Mm-hmm. Good point. Makisha, any insights on that one, cultural opportunities or challenges? In terms of cultural opportunities, um, I would have to give that some thought. I'm not sure. Um, but um, the cur- I say challenges probably are largely associated with the, the credit gap and the, and the um, access to resources and capital, but also access to social capital. And so um, you mentioned in the report that there were a large group of women that mentioned leaving the workplace due to workplace trauma and and that was that is so real in our tribe. And um, what comes with that is, um, and I don't think people tend to um, realize this or, or call it out as the elephant in the living room that it is, but that comes with its own set of challenges in terms of healing and mental care. Um, and as you enter into entrepreneurship and think about the work that it takes to be a saleswoman um, and some of the things you need to do in terms of follow-up, in terms of, um, in terms of, social capital building and networking outside of your comfort zone, um, there there's some work to do there to first and foremost, quite frankly, heal from um, the experiences that you dealt with as a black woman in the workplace and then moving into the entrepreneurship place, kind of mustering up the courage and the skill to be able to then pursue, um, play big in, in circles that maybe you aren't necessarily um, used to playing in or maybe even don't feel welcome in. Um, and so there's some of that work that we do in our sister leads program and our lead school program where we actually help people to be more aware of what triggers are and what triggers are and how to move past them and, and um, revenue generating activities and sales strategies um, without having them be hindered by that. So that's a cultural challenge or element of um, that's unique to I think our side. And so and, and I and I wanna bring it up because I feel like people underestimate that the role of or the impact of that in um our in our entrepreneurial to succeed and, and build um the social capital and the network that they need and to land the deals that they're trying to land. So that's probably awesome. the biggest thing. Um, yeah. 
And that's a great segue to the last question. And this one came in. Um, it, it came in through uh, Tiffany, who I referenced earlier as the, the photographer for the photos from Smash Glam. And I was going to actually ask this, that, this as the last question to close on. And we have about uh, three to four minutes left. So if you can each just touch on it briefly from your own lens and your own programs. Um, what are the one what is the one piece of advice that you give other organizations or services that want to target uh, black and brown women as their primary client base? This is Essence. I'll say don't be trendy. I think that, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but I hear it a lot because I am community, so I'm out and about often. Um, diversity and inclusion, black and brown, brown women are really, really hot topics. And I think that if you are going to be committed to assisting in whatever way that is, just make sure that you are actually getting to know what our challenges actually are before you try to make a blanket um, type of solution that may work for other demographics. Like we are very, very specific in our needs and, you know, uh, what it takes to help us move forward. And so we just would prefer, and it would be in anyone's best interest, just to make sure that you do your research first. Mm-hmm. Good point. Nikisha, Sherry? Maybe like um, speaking to those who might be interested in investing in initiatives to support um, and black women entrepreneur success, I think it's important um, to note that um, there's this combination of training and coaching that needs to be combined with actual resources for the business, so working capital, as well as access to technical services, everything from accounting to um, business um, coaching and those sorts of things. And so just I, I know that a lot of uh, often there's a um, – they're, you know, some just have requirements for what what spaces they want to play in to invest, but just knowing that all three of those are necessary for um, you to build out a, a robust program for entrepreneurial success. Awesome. And, Terry, you want to close us um, out on that question? I'll close you out on that. Um, I think it's important, and I'll agree with the last person, that to provide resources, um, great business ideas are great, but without resources, they can rarely come to fruition. And I think that many times we start businesses, um, organizations such as ours, while we provide um, below market rate value rents for the spaces that we have, we have not yet come to the level of providing that little bit of financial support as in marketing and things of that nature that would probably um, serve to take the entrepreneur further in success without them bootstrapping everything. That's great. And, um, you know, as we close it up, uh, you know, we're right on time. I know there's a couple questions that came in that are, that I'll answer you directly via email because they're very specific um, questions on opportunities in marketplaces. But in, in, in conclusion, I just want to say, you know, tell you Essence, Essence Lofton, Digital Undivided, Makisha Booth, Sisterpreneurs, and Terry Sanders, Fair Deal Marketplace, phenomenal programs. We appreciate what you're doing, the hard work and energy that you're putting into this. You are some of the few, few out there, and so you're, you're point people, you're game changers, and hopefully – it's, it's my objective, I know, with the support of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, to see if we can continue to get more programs like yours, better programs uh, in local communities to support black women. And I think you all coming on and being able to share, like, templates, ideas, concepts of what can be done, breaking some of the stereotypes, showing some of the opportunities and potentials of, of very specific intersectional programs is huge. So I want to give you all um, personal kudos and thanks for the hard work that you're doing in our communities to support Black women and encourage those that will be listening to this either live or on the uh, on on the web at a later date um, to really look into your environment and see what kind of change needs to occur to see if there's um, programs that are in place that can be expanded, modified, or targeted towards you know black women entrepreneurs or or advocate to build them um, in your community if they're not there. Again, 
I, I can't reiterate this, 1 million businesses in, from 2002 to 2012, um, when the new data comes out I, 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 in, uh, from the 2017, I, I believe we'll probably see an even um, an increased number for that. Uh, one out of every three women-owned businesses, one out of every five businesses was grown by a black woman in a decade period of time. And the attention and the support is, at this point, is, is not there. And so there's tremendous opportunity because this is not just a, uh, um, a essence reference that it's not just a social service deal. We're not just talking about addressing issues of, of, of low-income people. We're talking about economic revitalization through entrepreneurship with a, with a, a, a group of individuals, a demographic group that has showed tremendous motivation and momentum. And it's something that we should support. And we support it at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. And we encourage other communities to support it as well. So again, if you need, if you want to get a copy of the um, the report, uh, please visit KansasCityFed.org, uh, and then you'll be able to go there through the um, community development uh, link, and you'll be able to see everything there and, and track it through there. If you want to get in contact with these wonderful um, program leaders, their contact information is there. And if you have any additional questions, um, either on the topic or uh, how to execute some things in your own community, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, at the email that we provided. With that, I will turn it back to Gene to close us out, and we appreciate you all for attending and keep working hard. Thank you Del, so thanks much. so much. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Yeah, Del, thank you so much. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you bringing everybody together. That was a really great conversation. Um, so at this time, that does conclude our webinar today. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>